a land trust and a forestry organization in New Hampshire. We own some 190 properties. That's about 58,000 acres in more than 100 New Hampshire communities. And we would love to have you as a member of the Forest Society um, and your support. Hopefully you know about us from our website, www.forestsociety.org. And I'm not sure where you all heard about the program, but I'm really glad that you did because this is the inaugural session of our winter virtual program series that we're calling Cold is Cool. Um, and we have some science speakers and some authors uh, that are focusing on New Hampshire natural history topics, including today's talk about monarchs and milkweed communities next week. On Wednesday, we're going to be um, learning about New Hampshire Eagles from Chris Martin at New Hampshire Audubon, who also happens to be my co-host on Something Wild on the Stations of New Hampshire Public Radio. Um, and then in two weeks after that, Dan Sesney, a New Hampshire author, is going to talk about the White Mountain, rediscovering Mount Washington's hidden culture. And in February, we have John Campbell talking about climate change research being conducted at New Hampshire's own Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest by the USDA US Forest Service. And also in February, um, a program on sugar maple regeneration studies in New Hampshire and forest health by Natalie Clevett. And um, I'm gonna turn this over to my colleague, Carrie Deegan, who can talk about the protocol for today and introduce our guest speaker. And again, thank you for coming. Please put your questions in the chat and uh, we'll address those after the talk, thanks. Great, thank you, Dave. Um, before I have the honor of introducing our first presenter in this speaker series, I just wanna let everyone know we're gonna be recording today's session. So you can see the little red recording bu button at the top. If you'd rather not have your face on the recording, you can feel free to turn your video off. Um, that's entirely fine and up to you. Um, we're also going to ask that everyone keep themselves muted during the entire session. Um, if you have comments or questions, as Dave said, and we hope that you do have lots of questions, um, please enter them using the chat function. Um, and we'll read those out. Dave or I will read those out to Katie to answer at the end of her presentation. Um, so um, let's see. Hopefully she'll have time to answer all of those questions that we have. but. Um, if there are still remaining questions, um, Katie can answer them later and we'll send that around by email. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Katie Galetta. Katie is a student at Bowdoin College in Maine um, in the biology department. And she spent this past summer studying connections and interactions between monarch butterflies and caterpillars and other milkweed community insects that feed on common milkweed. Um, Katie's a native of Gofftown, New Hampshire, and so all of her study sites, she had more than 20 study sites that um, were spread across the southern half of New Hampshire. Many of them were on conserved lands, um, and a few of them, a couple, were on Forest Society properties. She had two sites in Deering, one on the Tom Rush Forest and one on the, our High Five Reservation in Deering. And um, that is how, you know, we were delighted to host her project and that's how I got to know Katie a little bit and learn about her research. Um, and admittedly, I'm a huge bug fan, so I thought this was very fascinating, but I think that all of you will find it just as fascinating as I did. So I'm going to turn it over now to Katie so that she can tell us about her project in the milkweed community. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction, Carrie. I am so excited to be here with everyone today. Um, so like Carrie said, my name is Katie Galetta and I'm from Goffstown, New Hampshire. And I'm currently a senior at Bowdoin College studying ecology, evolution, and marine biology. So I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Let's do that. And then we can get going here. Um, See, this works for us. How is that? Can everyone see that okay? Good, okay. Cool. So this summer, um, I was conducting a field research project throughout Southern New Hampshire, um, 
looking at monarch egg laying preferences on milkweed plants. And so this was for my honors thesis and it was a really cool way to kind of just dive deep into a really interesting um, local natural system. And so I'll talk to you a little bit about my project in particular later on, but today I really want to focus on the biology and ecology of the milkweed herbivore community um, that we can observe right here in New Hampshire in our backyards and hopefully draw you into a little bit of the evolutionary drama that takes place right under our noses every summer that we might not even realize is going on. So, one moment. Okay, so I'm willing to bet that most of you are familiar with monarchs, right? As adults, they're these super flashy, bright orange butterflies, and they're just really iconic signals that summer is well underway. So they have really incredibly interesting life histories where they have about two or three generations of monarchs that hatch throughout the summer around here. And you, these uh, midsummer generations only live a few weeks. Um, and so basically they get really big as caterpillars, they turn into butterflies, they mate, and then they die. And then at the end of the summer, there's one uh, generation, also called uh, the Methuselah generation or the super generation. And these monarchs are actually gonna live for several months. And these are gonna be the ones that are migrating 3000 miles south to Mexico. So every year at the end of the summer, monarchs, um, because really they're originally tropical insects, they, they like to be where it's nice and warm. And so, um, they're gonna kind of go south throughout uh, the southeastern US, go down to the central uh, mountains of Mexico and hang out in some fir forests for the winter. And then um, in the spring, they migrate back up. So that one generation is really interesting. But regardless of which summer generation a monarch is part of, their development is the same, right? So they're gonna hatch from a tiny little egg and usually those are laid alone on the underside of a fresh milkweed leaf. So here is a picture of a newly hatched monarch next to its egg, and that's the tip of my finger for scale. So as you can tell, they're incredibly small. Um, in the field looking for these, it was really, really hard. I had to basically overturn every single leaf for, of every single plant I was uh, looking at. So um, they're really small and they're really cute, I think. Um, and in order to grow into a healthy adult butterfly, these guys need to eat a ton and grow quickly enough to avoid being eaten themselves. Oops. So the five caterpillar growth stages are called instars, and these represent the development between molting as caterpillars need to shed their skin. So before making a chrysalis and turning into a butterfly, monarch caterpillar hatchlings are gonna grow 2,000 times in mass in the span of a few weeks. And as you can see here, the difference between um, right, the newly hatched monarch and then the one that's about to make a chrysalis, that is a really dramatic shift. And so they're gonna be eating a lot. <laughs> and so another interesting fact about monarchs is that caterpillars can only eat milkweed plants. If they run out of milkweed leaves or if somehow their mother lays an egg on a different kind of plant, the caterpillars won't make it. They're basically, at the caterpillar stage, they're basically just milkweed eating machines. So let's take a look at the milkweed that monarchs are going to eat around here. So milkweed in general, um, Asclepius, that's a genus full of plants that monarchs can eat. Um, but around here, common milkweed is really the only one that you'll see growing in the wild. And as the name suggests, it's a fast growing weedy plant, loves growing in fields and along roadsides. Um, Carrie mentioned that I was using uh, the Forest Society lands and deering, specifically High Five and Tom Rush Forest. And um, these are just really wonderful examples of these really beautiful old fields, especially High Five, just has an incredibly high population of uh, milkweed. So if you get the chance to go out there, it's really, really wonderful. But they really love these big old fields. Um, and they have these beautiful sprays of pinkish purple flowers that smell wonderful and attract a lot of pollinators. So you'll often see them kind of surrounded by bees trying to drink their nectar. In addition to re reproducing um, through seeds via pollination, milkweed can also grow by sending shoots up from underground stems called rhizomes. And as you can see in this picture on the right, this is a picture of one um, where the rhizome was pretty close to the surface of the soil, so it didn't take much for me to unroot it. Um, 
And all of these stems are attached to their neighbors through these rhizomes underground. And they can form large clones this way. And so if you were to take a genetic sample of the leaves of all of um, these different stems you see in this picture, they would all be identical because it's a clone. And this allows milkweed plants to spread really quickly from year to year. So even though monarchs are entirely dependent on milkweed, milkweed actually doesn't need monarchs to live at all. And this is a really interesting part of their biology that I think gets overlooked a lot, um, right? We know that monarchs need milkweed, but monarchs are actually really bad milkweed pollinators um, because the way that they stand on flowers when they're taking a drink, their bodies and their legs don't really come into contact with the pollen sacs that uh, milkweed produces. So m monarchs aren't really, you know, benefiting uh, milkweed plants per se. Right, and then in combination with the fact that the larvae are just going to eat the leaves, it's kind of in milkweed's best interest to deter monarchs as best it can, um, and other herbivores too. So, luckily, when it comes to interacting with herbivores, plants aren't as passive as we often think they are, and so milkweed has a few different ways to actively defend itself against unwanted attacks. So, milkweed uses three main forms of defense. And the main physical defense is latex, which is, you know, its namesake, right? It's a sticky, white, milky substance that's gonna flow from a milkweed leaf when you break it open. Milkweed plants have these latex canals that go all throughout the plant and they're separate from the sap canals. So they've got a really interesting vascular structure inside. And when it's exposed to air, the latex gets really gummy and really adhesive um, in, in a matter of minutes. And this can actually glue together the mouth parts of a caterpillar and even drown hatchlings if they're unable to escape the flow, which is what's happening in this picture right here. You can see that hatchling did not make it because those latex canals are under pressure and when they get punctured, it's gonna have a rush of latex. And um, this is one of milkweed's best defenses, especially against monarch caterpillars because they're so small and it's so easy for them to get entrapped in that. Another physical defense mechanism that they have is the presence of trichomes, which are tiny little plant hairs that milkweed has on the underside of its leaves. And you can kind of see in this picture, right, there's like a woolly texture, and those are those trichomes there. So this didn't evolve initially as um, an herbivore defense. It, it helps retain moisture, um, and these plants like being in the hot sun in the open, so they want to retain moisture. Um, but it definitely prevents a barrier for herbivore feeding um, because Right, if you think about it, this tiny little monarch, all it wants to do is um, bite the actual tissue of the leaf, but it has to go through all of these layers of hair first. And basically, if there's enough hairs there and it's obstructing the leaf too much, the monarchs will actually shave those hairs off. Um, so that's just kind of like annoying for them more than anything. And finally, milkweed's best studied defense is the production of toxins called cardenolides, which are found in all parts of the plant. And so if you've ever heard about how uh, milkweed kind of is dis a distasteful plant, this, that's why. It's these chemicals. Um, and so cardenolides can be fatal if enough are ingested because they interfere with an animal's sodium potassium pump. And basically, uh, along with other nervous system functions, it can stop their heart. But at lower doses, it's really, really bitter tasting and it, induce, it induces vomiting. So if you're an herbivore, you probably don't want to be consuming any unless you happen to be a milkweed specialist like monarchs, in which case it gets a little bit more complicated than that. So since monarchs are specialists and eat only milkweed, and we'll talk about why they're able to do that in a minute, um, they've adapted uh, cardenolide insensitive sodium pumps. So they're not as directly affected by those cardenolides as say a, a slug or a snail or something else that might wanna come by and eat the plant. So they've got this adaptation um, that helps them tolerate it. However, when a plant has a particularly strong concentration of cardenolides, which is especially common in other milkweed species, um, not around here, monarch's development gets slowed way down and then they're left as an exposed caterpillar for more time. So to kind of illustrate this, um, Right, you might have heard that monarchs are brightly colored as adults and caterpillars in order to advertise that they taste bad to predators. And this is absolutely correct. And the reason for that is because they're able to store these milkweed cardenolides instead of um, kind of having them be absorbed into their body and have a negative effect on them. 
and this is uh, this process is called sequestration. So as caterpillars, they're going to be eating all those leaves, processing the cardinalides from those leaves that they're eating, and sequestering them in their bodies. And then they're going to remain stored in their bodies um, throughout metamorphosis so that the adults are distasteful too. So to visualize this, I've taken a few pictures from a classic monarch study from 1967. As you can see in these pictures, the researchers are feeding uh, an adult monarch to a blue jay. So it's going to remove the wings, right? There's not really any nutritional content to eating the wings. And after a few minutes here, we're going to see that the birds would vomit in this experiment. And this happened every single time that they ran these trials. And then, um, once they've got this result, they fed different blue jays, monarchs that had eaten a different species of milkweed that didn't have cardenolides present. So, in all the different species of milkweed, there's kind of a range of cardenolides and latex content and things like that. So, they fed it another milkweed, um, that one just didn't have cardenolides, and as you might imagine, those monarchs didn't sequester any toxins, because there weren't any to sequester in their bodies, and therefore they weren't distasteful and the birds didn't throw up. And so this was one of the early studies that led to our current understanding of milkweed chemical ecology. And it also, I personally think, has the best figures that I've ever seen in a scientific paper. Um, this is just a really cool project. It just makes a lot of sense intuitively. Um, and you got a vomiting blue jay. That doesn't happen very often. So... ...in uh, other literature likely will be ability to take cards in order to sequester or other potential predators. So over time, as the cardenolide tolerant caterpillars kept munching on milkweed leaves, the plant would increase its defenses and got more toxic. And so then this required monarchs to invest more energy into coping with those toxins and so on and so forth. And this process is called coevolution, where two species are interacting and influencing each other's evolution. And here's basically two ways to envision this process as it pertains to the evolutionary history of monarchs and milkweed. So you can think of it as a cycle like here on the left, or you can think of it like an arms race on the right. And both are visualizing the same process where you've got increased investment in defensive traits by the plant and increased investment in traits that exploit the plant by the insect. And this is kind of how this relationship has developed over evolutionary time. Monarchs are not the only insects to eat milkweed, though. Um, being in a milkweed patch, because you get to kind of know the insects that eat it. So in the Northeast, um, 10 other insect species um, ate living off of it. So here, um, and we'll kind of learn a little bit more about each of them in a minute, but we've got Katie, I'm not sure if you can hear us, but it seems like you've frozen up. Maybe you could try turning off your video. I see. Uh oh, did I? You froze I lost on that one. Yep. Yeah. And you may want to keep that, just that connection going, Katie, and then like just keep your video off. Yeah, I can do that. Um, but we lost you right when you had introduced the uh, all of the milkweed animals, like all the the milkweed community slide. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, everyone. I'm working here from an iPad and a laptop, so I had my volume off. I'm sorry about that. Let me. Go back there. Okay. That's where you lost me? Yep, right there. Awesome. Okay, I will pick up from there. Um, apologies, everyone. So, um, so yeah, so monarchs are not the only ones that are going to be eating milkweed plants. Um, and here in the Northeast on common milkweed, we have um, 10 other species that have uh, independently evolved the ability to eat milkweed as well. 
um, in a similar way that monarchs have. And so um, we're gonna get into a little bit more about each of these in a minute, but here we've got three different beetle species, two true bugs, um, a moth species, and we've got the caterpillars here, um, a fly species, and we're gonna talk about what this blobby thing here is in a minute, and then three species of aphids. And these are basically, you know, if you're going into a milky patch around here in the middle of the summer, these are pretty much the cast of characters that you're going to see. Not too much else is going to be eating milkweed. So we'll start with the aphids. And here um, we've got the three different species. And so these ones are all going to be around at different times of the season. Aphis asclepiatus is going to be kind of early season. Aphis nerii, probably our more conspicuous one, um, is later in the season. And they're all slightly different, um, but they're all going to be feeding on the sap. And uh, it's kind of it's kind of interesting to see the progression over time with these guys. Next, we have the seed eaters, and so we've got these two milkweed bugs. Um, as you can tell, they're very brightly patterned, um, and generally, you're going to see these kind of colonizing the seeds the seed pods later in the season. Um, their larvae will eat the seeds inside of those seed pods and then as they develop they'll kind of um, form these big colonies around them. And then we also have this milkweed uh, stem weevil and these ones are interesting because in the spring um, they eat the stems and then in the fall their larvae are going to be uh, eating the seed pods as well. But they also often do eat leaves too, um, even though that's not their main focus. And so this is kind of what their um, damage looks like here, where you've got um, this, they'll punch these holes on the underside of the leaf along the main vein, and that allows the latex to drain out, right? Because I mentioned uh, otherwise the latex is going to really gum up those insect mouth parts and um, we don't want that. So they're just going to drain that out of there. Next, apologies for not having the names. I just realized that I don't have those on there, but we've got the leaf eaters and these are generally the more conspicuous um, herbivores that you're really going to notice that they're doing damage. So up here we've got um, the milkweed tussock moth and you probably recognize these. They form really big colonies and they're really good at completely skeletonizing a whole milkweed plant very easily. Um, so you can tell that those have been around because there'll just be a lot of them and then they also really will destroy all this leaf tissue. Um, we also have this leaf mining fly and basically you're going to see these sort of blistery things on leaves and that's because a fly has laid an egg in between the layers of the leaf tissue and then the larvae as it develops is just going to eat the tissue in between the layers of the leaf. So if you were to peel that open um, you would find a little tiny larvae there and they're really interesting to look at. You don't really see the adults very often though. Um, down here we have the longhorn milkweed beetle or the four-eyed milkweed beetle um, and these ones I when I was doing my work uh, it was definitely the most common um, herbivory was from these guys and they, this one's really distinctive because it's got this kind of U or V-shaped notch at the tip of the leaf. Um, typically they like to eat leaves towards the top of the plant and they also you can't really tell very well in that picture but they have these little pinchers and um, just like how the milkweed stem weevil would punch holes in the main vein um, to drain the latex. These guys are going to use their pinchers and poke some holes along the vein before they um, are going to eat the tip of that leaf there. And then we have the milkweed, uh, swamp milkweed leaf beetle and these guys just kind of have a little munching pattern. It's not necessarily super distinctive and um, uh, consistent from leaf to leaf, but um, these guys, the main way to tell them is uh, they're, they're present earlier in the season than most of the other munchers here. And finally, we've got monarch damage. And so this picture just kind of illustrates the two main kinds of monarch damage that you'll see often. So the little bit right here, that's from a newly hatched monarch. And they just kind of punch these little holes in the leaf. They'll sort of, um, they'll scrape the, uh, a ring around themselves and it kind of lets the latex drain out and then they'll kind of eat that, um, that island where the latex has been drained from that tissue. And then as they get older, what they'll do, um, you'll often see the large caterpillars on the underside of leaves um, sort of cutting a notch in this main 
uh, stem here and that's going to allow the latex to drain out and then they can eat all of this leaf tissue that um, no longer has an active latex flow. So those are the really distinctive types of damage. And this is really the best way, um, if you're looking for monarch caterpillars, look for their damage first, because a lot of the times it'll be a lot easier to find these little punched out circles in the leaves than trying to find those teensy tiny little caterpillars there. So knowing all of this, right, we've clearly um, looked at how uh, you know, you've got different um, herbivores kind of doing different things in order to, um, in order to be able to make a living off of this plant. And um, it's also interesting to think about a concept called induced defense. So um, basically induced defense is the process where um, there's herbivory damage that happens and the, a plant is able to um, basically sense that there has been damage and respond accordingly. And usually what happens with that is um, we'll have, uh, you know, let's say a little baby monarch is going to come over and munch and the plant is going to sense that it's lost some tissue damage and might also interact with some chemical in the insect saliva. And in response, the plants can um, increase their cardenolide content and also increase latex production. And this is a really interesting concept because it's also been shown in milkweeds that different species induce different defenses. So uh, whereas a monarch might induce greater cardenolide contents in response to feeding, um, a swamp milkweed leaf beetle is going to uh, really dramatically increase the latex production, but not so much cardenolides. So knowing this, going into my honors project, um, I wanted to know kind of how this induced defense works in the field. A lot of the, the research that's been done has been done um, with experimentally manipulated milkweed plants where they would grow a plant in a greenhouse, they would have an insect um, bite a certain amount of leaves, and then they would, um, you know, see what happens after that. But like I mentioned, milkweeds in the field, they grow these giant clones, there's a whole bunch of different interactions going on, and so I kind of wanted to take um, the current literature understanding of what happens when monarchs are damaged by herbivores and see if I could observe similar patterns in the field. Um, and knowing that herbivory can induce cardenolide content, I also specifically wanted to look at um, milkweed, uh, monarch egg laying, which I know I, haven't, I didn't really talk very much about, but basically monarch mothers um, can lay on, can sit on a plant and taste it with their feet and legs. They've got a whole, um, pattern that they do to kind of taste a plant and feel it out. And um, knowing this and knowing that herbivory might be increasing cardenolide content, I wanted to see if, um, if leaf damage in the field has an observable effect on um, whether or not they would decide to lay an, uh, an egg on a milkweed leaf. And the, the thought behind this is basically that a monarch mom is going to be facing a trade-off between wanting a plant with low cardinalide content so that her caterpillar can grow up really fast and healthy versus um, needing one that has enough cardinalide so that it can still sequester them and, um, you know, have that defense for its own purposes. So there's kind of a trade-off there, and I just wanted to see if I could see any patterns in the field. And kind of going off of that um, similar idea, I wanted to see if herbivory is impacting flower visitors because it's also been shown that cardenolides are present in milkweed nectar. And this is a super interesting concept because um, usually you think of milk, you think of nectar as being a reward for pollinators, right? You want to have a nice sugary drink for a pollinator to come, really enticing. And um, hopefully you'll get pollinated if you've got really good nectar. So the fact that there are these toxins present in nectar poses a really interesting ecological question. And so I wanted to know, you know, kind of get a little bit more information about in the field, is there an observed trade-off between defense and um, pollination? And to do this, we looked at um, whether there was a relationship between leaf damage and um, the number of insects coming to flowers to get a drink. So I used a whole bunch of study sites in Southern New Hampshire. I know that, um, you know, obviously I worked with the Forest Society for some of these sites. I also worked with a couple other people I know are in the audience right now. So thank you to everyone who 
uh, offered me their property and I had 33 sites in total throughout Southern New Hampshire. And I also was really lucky in that another um, student in my advisor's lab this summer was working on um, pollination on uh, milkweeds uh, in North Carolina. So all of my um, pollination data are from her. And so she was working in the Raleigh-Durham area. And essentially what I was doing is I was going out in the field, I laying out a transect line and looking at um, the height and number of leaves damaged by each individual species. I was kind of like identifying, you know, this is from a milkweed, uh, a longhorn milkweed beetle versus a monarch caterpillar versus a stem weevil. Um, and just quantifying the leaf damage on those plants. And then I was also searching for monarch eggs and caterpillars, as well as seed pods as kind of a proxy for the plants, um, whether or not the plant was old or not. And I'll kind of talk about these a little bit more in context in a second. Um, and as I said, newly hatched monarchs are super teensy tiny. So uh, that proved to be a little, little bit tricky at times, but um, it was really fun and rewarding um, and Basically, I just kind of wanted to get, a, with measuring all of these different um, physical parameters of the plant, I wanted to get an overview of what, um, what the characteristics of the habitat that was available look like, and then um, also parsing out relationships in terms of the leaf herbivory damage. And then in the North Carolina surveys, um, Deva is the student who was working on that, and Deva was looking at um, leaf damage as well as the number of flower visitors on um, blooms in 90 seconds. So she wasn't really identifying the damage to species and she wasn't really looking at monarchs, but she was just looking at pollinators for me. So basically what I found um, kind of looked like a lot of the similar patterns to um, the known literature, which is exciting and <laughs> kind of good to see that those, those patterns are still there. And so um, one thing is that monarchs prefer it's known in the literature that monarchs prefer to lay eggs on young plants and that's because right the plant is still growing it's going to be fresh healthy nutritious and there's going to be more food for their babies in the future and um i didn't exactly see this trend in the field as i would use um, milkweed pods as a proxy it didn't have a huge effect um but if you're looking at like towards the end of the summer you'll notice that you're going to find more eggs on the young little shoots that are just popping out of the ground instead of the older senescing plants. Um, they also have a preference for tall plants. This I didn't really see so much in my surveys because um, I had a really wide range of tall and short plants, um, but this is kind of uh, the idea, um, right, you think of like a tall but a young plant that's going to offer a lot more food and it'll be healthy as opposed to like a really tall old plant that that young and old um, preference is sort of more relevant to monarchs but also if they've got access to a young plant that's also really big and has a lot of leaves then they're going to choose that. So this is something that I did observe in my uh, research is that they also um, are going to be laying fewer eggs per plant um, on milkweed in low density patches. And so this is just kind of, not so much a preference, but more just the concept that if there's a big patch of milkweed, there's just more real estate available and there'll just be fewer eggs per plant. But where it really gets interesting and where I've got a lot of work um, ahead of me to parse this out is that it's been shown that milkweeds, uh, monarchs prefer to lay eggs on plants with inter intermediate levels of crinolides. And this kind of harkens back to the concept um, of them wanting to strike this balance between good food and protection. And so I found that the monarchs preferred to lay eggs on um, plants with no damage. And so I have a lot of work cut out for me in figuring out how my study relates to um, this and how I might be able to uh, kind of examine this relationship without having taken um, chemical samples from the plants, because that's really a limiting factor in my project, but um, there's a lot of different things that I can look at in further models that I'm going to run. And then also I found that more insects visit flowers on milkweed with less leaf damage, and this is kind of what you would expect, is that they um, are kind of going for the nectar that's less toxic, and um, this, so this is kind of presents us with more questions about, you know, is it worth it for, mo for milkweeds to have toxins in their nectar, why is this the case, um, 
And so that's a really interesting question that really hasn't gotten a lot of attention in the literature. And so um, I am going to be working on this thesis for the rest of the school year. I've got a whole semester ahead of me. And these are the kind of questions that I'm going to be asking with all of that knowledge of, um, you know, the milkweed herbivore community and milkweed um, ecology kind of putting all of these things that I observed in the field together and seeing um, if a field study can actually answer these questions or if we really do need to have those more controlled manipulated experiments. Um, so I know we're running on time. So I want to wrap it up by just expressing my gratitude. I, this was such a gigantic undertaking and I could not have done it um, without the help of so many people. Like I said, I know some of the people who I worked with directly this summer are in the audience and I just want to reiterate my thanks. Um, I could not have done it without all of these property owners and contacts. Um, also, Carrie came out in the field with me one day and wrote a really wonderful Union Leader article about my work and also um, published it in the Forest Society's Forward's notes. And that has really gotten me connected with a whole bunch of people. So that was really wonderful. And of course, my advisor, Dr. Patty Jones at Bowdoin College and Deva Holloman, who did all the pollination data collection. Um, so without further ado, um, oh, I also just really want to take a second to recognize and honor the fact that this research was conducted on Indigenous lands, um, right? I was working with all of these property owners in New Hampshire um, and also on the traditional territorial lands of the Penacook and Pentawket people. So it's really important for me, um, since I was spending so much time on these lands, really getting to know um, the plants and animals that are living right here in New Hampshire with us, that we just recognize that. So. Finally, I just want to um, thank you all for being here so much. Um, I hope you learned a little bit about uh, monarch and milkweed ecology and all the other critters that you can look, to look at um, next summer once we don't have quite so much snow on the ground. Um, but yeah, I will be happy to take any questions you have at all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. Um... I would, if people do have questions, you um, please put them in the chat if you do. I know I had a question, I think Dave had one as well that we can start questions with, but we'll be happy to read other questions that people have or comments. Um, so I recently, Katie, heard something in the news and I think it was that the monarch butterfly was, and I might have the wording wrong, was like legally, deemed legally worthy of protection under the Endangered Species Act recently, mm -hmm. but that it would not be getting protection basically anytime soon due to lack of funding. I'm not sure if I had that right. And if you wanted to elaborate a little bit more on that. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's a really wonderful question. And that's something that's um, super new. So uh, the I don't remember exactly what department of the government it was, but basically they just made this decision. I think it was December 15th that um, yeah, so monarchs have been under review for um, being listed as endangered for a few years now. And basically that process has a lot of scientists coming together and people reviewing all these things. And so they finally made a call in December that um, you're absolutely right. Basically what happened is they said, we know that the monarch is in trouble. Um, we think that it does deserve um, greater protection, but there are bigger priorities that we're going to focus our resources on right now and our energy. Um, and so it's basically on the short list. So every year as they're reviewing um, other species to put under, um, you know, it, under listing and things like that, the monarchs are going to remain on that list. Um, they're already pre-approved as, you know, yes, we know that this is an issue. And basically they'll be reviewed annually until it's deemed that they're either actually endangered or, you know, that they're doing good, which is, you know, the goal, of course. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the status of that. So something definitely to look for every year as they're reviewing that. That's a wonderful question. Great. Um, so I have a question from Vicki that says, do all 10 herbivores feed on multiple Asclepius species, common milkweed, swamp milkweed, all the different species in that genus? Yeah, so that's a really great question. I, not all of them do. I don't know off the top of my head 
which ones are super specific. I want to say that the longhorn milkweed beetles only eat common milkweed, um, or that's like the majority of their diet. Um, most of them can be found on different ones. I know that I've got swamp milkweed in my garden and those yellow aphids um, love it. They're all over the place. Um, and then you'll also notice like the swamp milkweed leaf beetle that's named after that swamp milkweed, but it's also eating common milkweed. So most of them do eat other species. Um, it kind of comes down to the specific chemistry because there are some species, especially out west and then in the southwest, a lot of those species have really, really narrow leaves, a ton of cardenolides and like really high latex content and they're just really unpleasant. And so I have a feeling that, you know, in terms of um, the relative chemistry and defense mechanisms of um, other plants. They'll probably eat ones that have similar levels of defenses. I'll read a, I'll read a question. Yeah, go ahead. I'll just jump right in there, Carrie. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and ask some questions that are From, from my, my friend Annette and Tony Imerlika um, said, Annette says, I heard it was bad to collect the caterpillars and raise them indoors because they don't fly very well if they're raised indoors. Should I stop raising monarchs? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. Um, I will say a, a lot of, I personally raise them. I'll raise a couple every summer. So don't feel like you're destroying the population. You're doing a good thing. They probably have a much higher rate of um, survival if you bring them inside and take care of them. Um, but a few things on that. One, it's better to collect them as soon as you can um, if you find like a new hatchling or even an egg. And this prevents them from being attacked by parasites. Um, right, so there's a lot of like parasitic flies and wasps, or there's a handful of species that will basically lay their eggs inside of a developing caterpillar. Um, and then over time, I've never personally seen this, but I've heard horror stories where over time your caterpillar is just growing and all of a sudden there are parasites bursting out of its body. So in order to prevent that from happening, because if you have, you know, one parasitized caterpillar in a whole colony where say you're raising 20 at a time, which I don't re recommend having them all in one housing unit um, because if you've got one parasitized, then that, um, depending on what parasitized it, that might spread. Um, the other thing is there is a microscopic parasite um, or a fungus, maybe it's, I'm not super familiar with it. It's called OE. Um, so people who have raised milkweed, uh, monarchs before might know this, but um, you kind of are supposed to screen the new butterflies and caterpillars for these little black spores that are indicative of an infection um, because this is a really harmful um, pathogen that can spread really easily between caterpillars. But I will say the around here, that's not really too much of an issue, um, right? We've got a winter, it's able to get rid of um, that disease in particular. The, the issue, when the, the places where this becomes an issue is down south, right? Where they have, cater they've got some resident populations of the monarchs that um, won't migrate. And um, they're basically able to kind of, those that OE pathogen is able to kind of persist. And that's when you can get really bad infections and you might get a butterfly that's really badly deformed because of it. So basically as they don't, I don't think they always come out deformed, but if they've got this infection, then their wings don't form right. And in that case, they won't be able to fly. Around here though, short answer is you're probably totally fine. Um, I would definitely recommend everyone learn about OE if you're interested in learning about how to take care of caterpillars, um, just so that you know what to look for. Um, but other than that, keep doing what you're doing. I always have so much fun every summer with my mom, um, raising a couple and, and letting them go in their kitchen or, you know, from our front steps, so. Well, that's a, that's a relief because there are literally tens of thousands of school children whose primary first connection to the natural world comes from their empathy from raising a little caterpillar, you know, to a monarch butterfly. And that story captivates children and inculcates a new generation of conservationists and future lepidopterists and biologists. Absolutely. I very much remember my first grade class here and we did that. I had a great time. Um, I wouldn't say that necessarily sparked my uh, interest in biology, but it certainly has, was a memory that stuck with me for a very long time. And I agree. I think it's a really fantastic way, right? The whole process of metamorphosis in general is so easy to get kids interested in. Um, and that's part of why I love studying monarchs is because everyone loves them. Um, anytime I was out in the field, people would want to chat with me about them. Obviously, everyone here is interested in learning more about them. So um, anyway, 
way you can get directly involved in learning about their biology is, I think it's wonderful. Um, another question in the chat from Chris A. Blackstone. I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Um, can you tell us, Katie, again, the total time span and how long you did the research, how long you've conducted the research? Yeah, so I was working um, from early July until um, mid-September. Uh, and so this was kind of tricky. So uh, this was not my first um, choice of spending my summer. I was hoping to um, get a research position elsewhere, but obviously with the pandemic, my options were limited. So I was actually working on this while also working 20 to 30 hours a week as a grocery store cashier. So this was kind of any day I wasn't working, I was out in the field with the monarchs. Um, so I, you know, I really enjoyed getting to spend some time outside. Um, even on the days when I didn't necessarily want to be out there, I just learned so, so much. And so yeah, basically, that's when the milkweed community is most active anyway. Um, and that's monarchs will usually start to be migrating back up here around the middle of July, end of July, definitely. Um, yeah. Katie, we have a couple of questions um, that pertain. One is from Marshall. It says, for those of us attempting to cultivate milkweed around our homes, do you have specific tips for cultivation and supporting local monarchs? And then from Jane, which is sort of this in the same vein, it's sort of besides no pesticides or insecticides on milkweeds, what else can we do to help these plants and the insect communities? Yeah, so one thing that I will say um, is if you're looking to purchase milkweed seeds or milkweed plants, try to get them from local nurseries and try to get local ecotypes. Um, so some research has kind of been done and it seems like it might I don't know exactly what it was, but it kind of messes with their migration if you if they are eating a lot of different um, like species that that aren't supposed to be in that area or something like that. So I would just say look look up the native um, milkweed plants that are around here. Common milkweed is by far the most common, obviously, but we actually have a really cool diversity of milkweed plants that are native to here. And if you can get local ecotypes. Um, it kind of just, you know, helps support that native um, pollinator diversity in general, too. And uh, it, those plants are also more adapted to, you know, you won't need to water them as much and things like that. They'll kind of be more adapted to um, living around here. But basically, there's lots of different kinds of milkweed. So kind of play around with that. It's not all just common milkweed. Um, and I would say another thing is leave all the other little critters alone. I know a lot of people have a tendency to want to, um, the, the no pesticides thing is great. A lot of people have a tendency to want to remove aphids and especially the milkweed tussock moths because right, they'll just defoliate a whole milkweed plant. And I would say if you really do feel the need to get rid of them, just relocate them somewhere else if you don't want them in your garden. But having a wide diversity of um, those herbivores is going to support a diverse, um, insect predator community too. And so kind of just by having, in addition to milkweed, just other flowering native plants, um, by having habitat for all these different herbivores and predators, you're kind of just making a more resilient community in general. Um, and also if you're gonna mow it, try to mow it either early July before monarchs get there or late fall. That way you're not accidentally mowing any <laughs> caterpillars and destroying that habitat for them. So I don't see more questions, but I've got the central question that we were all raised with, which is if it takes three generations of migration through Texas and the Ohio Valley and then into New England where the King generation is born, and then they in turn migrate all the way back to the mountains of Mexico and wintering areas. What is the current state of thinking of how does a monarch born in New Hampshire, a monarch caterpillar hatched in New Hampshire, return to a place known only to its great, great grandmother? Is there any, is that a mystery or is there a science that explains how they can do such a thing? Yeah. So. It's really, really interesting. And 
really crazy, right? If you just think they're this big and they're migrating 3,000 miles, it's really just mind boggling. And I have so much respect for that generation that just goes all the way down there. So um, in terms of the actual uh, mechanics of it, um, it seems like monarchs are really good at riding on the wind. So they're not beating their wings the whole time, right? Like other, you know, birds and everything, they're gonna be kind of going with the flow of weather patterns and things like that. Um, but in terms of like the specifics of, you know, how this one generation is able to go so far, I'm not super familiar with it. Um, I would highly, highly recommend for those of you who are interested in, in learning more about um, monarchs and milkweed and a little bit more about um, the herbivore community in general, um, Dr. Anurag Agrawal from Cornell is um, a really well-respected and established um, milkweed chemical ecologist. And he, I believe in 2018, wrote just an absolutely wonderful book called Monarchs and Milkweed. Um, and it's all about their co-evolution and basically the history of monarch biology and pretty much everything that's known right now about their biology. And it's a really wonderful read because it goes over a bunch of science, but it's also just super easy to understand. It talks about cardinalide chemistry in a way that I, as someone who, I really just don't enjoy chemistry. It's really accessible <laughs> and um, a really enjoyable read. So if you're interested, I know that there was a whole section on the mechanics of their migration. So um, again, I, I'm not super familiar exactly with it, but that's certainly a place to look into um, if you're interested in learning more. I'm sure we can link that that title, Katie, in our, you know, when we will probably send out a link to this recording and we can awesome. all yeah. look for that. I, I would really want to read that book too. So. Yeah, it's, I read it over the summer as I was kind of getting into, because I never worked with monarchs or milkweed or insects really before. Um, I've, I've, most of my background is in marine biology. Um, uh, and I was abroad this spring um, in Tanzania working with mammals. And so this was kind of just a huge pivot for me. <laughs> so I had a lot of learning to do and a lot of it was just very hands-on, but this book was absolutely um, essential in just getting myself oriented in what I was getting into. And obviously I've got, you know, the whole milkweed community shirt that I've got on. I've really just fully jumped into the whole uh, monarch ecology, milkweed ecology thing in this book <laughs> is certainly in large part um, a reason for that. And Krissa Blackstone says, hey, what a pivot from your original plan to the Milk Week Monarch research and gives you a high five. Awesome. Yeah, it definitely was a big pivot for me, but um, it worked out, I think, and I'm still working on it. I've got a lot of work to do, but it's been fun. Before we wrap up, what do you plan to do after graduation from Bowdoin since you're in your senior year? Yeah, um, we'll see. I don't know yet. <laughs> uh, great question. So um, one thing is I want to take a few years off. I want to go to grad school at some point. Ultimately, down the road, I'm hoping to um, pursue a career in environmental education, conservation outreach. Doing stuff like this is my favorite part. I, I enjoy research, but really... Um, of this whole project that I've been working on, reaching out to people, getting in touch with the community um, and doing outreach like this is really what I enjoy. So I wanna keep doing things like this. Um, and uh, at some point I'll go to grad school. I did just apply to one program working with um, these really rare species of butterflies that only live on the top of Mount Washington. So maybe I'll end up doing uh, a master's program looking at their conservation with UMass for the next two years. I don't know, we'll see, but something along those lines. Nice. Actually, Anna Berry, who's with us from my colleague, just posted um, Carrie's article in the Union Leader about Katie and her milkweed uh, research. So if you look in the chat function while we're still all here, you can find a, a link. And yes, this program is recorded, and we will be posting a link to this Zoom recording on our website and probably uh, talking about it via Facebook as well. Yeah, we'll post it on the link to the recording on the Cold is Cool page. So that's forestsociety.org slash cold is cool. Thank you so much, Katie. This was terrific. I know that everyone enjoyed it. And um, we really appreciate you coming on to give this talk. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I know. I saw, thank you, everyone, for your patience with that little uh technical difficulty we had in the middle there, but I've really enjoyed it. And thank you everyone for attending. 
and we hope to see you all join us again next Wednesday and subsequent Wednesdays this winter. Where else were you going to go? And uh, come and join us to learn more about the, the outdoors and then get outside and enjoy it. Really want to thank all of the people I see who I know are members of the Forest Society. Would love to have the rest of you as members and supporters and also joining us for subsequent programs this winter. I hope you have a peaceful evening. And I really want to thank you all for, for, for coming and spending time with us tonight. All right. Thank you so much, guys. I really Bye, appreciate Katie. it. Bye. Okay, I'm going to.